Hello and welcome to There's No Business Like, a podcast where friends and industry colleagues explore topics and interview leaders in our industry of professional theatrical touring. Hello and welcome back to There's No Business Like. I'm Katie Miller from the Midland Center for the Arts. I am joined by my friends, Brian. Hey, Katie. Brian Zelmer from KU Presents. And Danielle. Hey, it's Danielle from the Alden in McLean, Virginia. And right down the line, Josh. Josh Benson, rocking it from Marion, Illinois. And Kevin. Kevin Maynard from Quad City Arts in Rock Island, Illinois. Welcome back to the pod. We're so excited for our conversation today. But before we dive in, I have a question for all of you. What is We're it? We're going to have... <laughs> <laughs> No well, Danielle. This time. Sorry. This is so unusual. Like she's throwing the format out the window. Let's go for it. I am going to take all of you in Brian's time machine and we're all going to hop in together and uh, travel back in time to answer my question of the day, which is thinking back to when you were a young person, maybe an undergraduate, maybe doing internships. If you had followed the plan from then and followed what you thought you were going to do professionally, What would you be doing today instead of, you know, being an arts administrator? My goal was to be a CPA and to be working at a big four firm. I mean, so like stupid long hours, just doing audits and and those kind of things. And I went as far to test for two of my CPA, like like two of the exams for my CPA license and then have this realization of going, oh, I hate this. I don't want to ever actually have to use that. So yeah, I think I'd be doing a lot, a lot of accounting and, and auditing. And I mean, admittedly, probably making more money, but I don't know that I'd be happier. For me, I mean, I'd still be in the field and it wouldn't be nearly as depressing as Kevin. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I think you'd have more time for your ultra running, ultra marathon That's true. running. That's but true. I envision myself as one of the Imagineers working either in lighting or like scenery design for Disney and working in the parks. And that was, that was my career goal. I was similar to Josh. I started out in college as a performer and saw that track. I was hoping to get to Broadway someday. And then my, my end goal, I could see all the way back then to retirement. My like goal in retirement would be to be a performer in Disney world. So I probably would have bumped into Josh anyway, even if I took that different path. So I sort of had my realization of what I more or less wanted to do while I was in high school because I was an intern at a community theater and realized that um, the person running the theater had a job. And I was like, oh, so you can like do theater and be a professional person. So going into college, my goal was to graduate and then take her job. And she was like, fool like she'd like already offered it to me like she was like ready to retire she was like yeah go get this arts admin degree so well josh danielle and brian you all like started in the arts somehow and, and have ended up in the arts but like kevin i started in a completely different field i went to undergrad for political science and with a like a communications and theater studies double major, uh, but I was convinced <laughs> I was going to go to Capitol Hill. I was going to be a staffer in like a congressional office, working eighteen hour days, not ever see the light of day, live in like a tiny little apartment in Washington, and that was going to be my life. And I was going to change the world. And um, got into undergrad, got into school, and realized like, oh. I don't have the personality for that. And I was just spending more and more time in the theater department. And my professors were really pushing me into like production and direction and stage management. Uh, And then my senior year, when I was supposed to be doing an internship to finish out my environmental policy minor, uh, I said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to produce and direct my own show, uh, which I did. So didn't actually finish my minor. Uh, (laughs) But definitely thought I was going to do public policy, and now I do arts administration. So two completely different things. So, well, thank you all for sharing. This directly ties into the conversation we are going to have with three students, three graduate students at American University. And the reason that they are joining us today is because they are three of the leaders of the Emerging Arts Leaders Symposium, which happens on an annual basis at American University. Um, I met the chair of the program actually at the, the 2023 APAP Conference, Association of Performing Arts Professionals, and really hit it off. And we wanted to chat with them for the pod. So hope you enjoy. Hi, my name is Morgan Fuller. And my undergrad was in mass communication and theater from the University of North Carolina at Asheville. 
And now I'm in the grad program for arts management at American University. Hey, uh, my name is Lisette Dufour. I have my bachelor's degree in technical theater from Binghamton University, and I am currently studying to get my master of public administration from American University. Hi, I'm Faith Smith. I did my undergraduate degree at Florida Southern College, and I did that in music education and music performance on clarinet. And now I'm in the arts management master's program at American University. Excellent. Welcome, everybody, to the No Business Like podcast. I'm so excited to have all three of you as our guests today. Funnily enough, I actually met Morgan at the APAP Conference, 2023 APAP Conference Association of Performing Arts Professionals. So No Business Like team, as you may know, were invited to host a professional development session. And Morgan was at my table during that. And so we got to chatting, had a wonderful conversation, um, and learned about all of the leadership opportunities Morgan is taking advantage of at American. We connected and really wanted to have you and your colleagues on as podcast guests as the next generation of arts leaders here in the United States. So welcome so much to the podcast. Thanks so much for having us, Katie. All right. We're going to go ahead and dive right in. So first of all, can you please just tell us a little bit about your graduate program and how the three of you know each other? Yeah, so I can dive on in. We are all at American University. Faith and I are in the arts management program, and Lizette is over in the School of Public Affairs. But we're all in the same university. The arts management program is a small but mighty program at AU surrounding the really core tenets of arts management. Um, We learn um, a lot of really broad things about financial management, cultural policy, marketing, all sorts of things in the arts. So tell us a little bit more about the Emerging Arts Leader Symposium. What is it like taking on leadership roles for this program at this moment in your graduate work? So Emerging Arts Leaders Symposium, or EELS for short, started out as a capstone idea uh, by a student in our arts management graduate program and grew to become an event drawing emerging arts leaders from around the country uh, to connect for a day of conversation about issues in our field. It's really awesome to be part of this group because we're putting into practice everything that we're learning in our classes. It's real world and making real connections, working through things and really challenging problems sometimes with each other. Uh, So it's been a really awesome hands-on experience. Oh, that's excellent and so exciting. And I know you each have a different leadership role with the symposium. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. So I'm the executive director of the symposium. It's a team of uh, six of us. We plan and execute the symposium together, and I'll let uh, Faith and Lizette tell a little bit about their roles. I am the finance director for EOLS. I basically just do budgeting. Me and Morgan right now are working on all of our purchase orders that we need to go through for the symposium so that we make sure we have all the supplies needed. Excellent. What's that? I'm the marketing and communications coordinator. So I work very closely with Allie, who is our director of marketing and communications. And uh, we work together to implement different communications and outreach strategies. You know, this includes creating social media graphics and publishing different content to those social media platforms, trying to create community engagement. Wonderful. And what has it been like for the three of you and the rest of your team to step into what are pretty big leadership roles Um, in a student-run program that is bringing people, like you said, together from around the country. That's like a a pretty big deal. We like to say that we are a small but mighty team. We do a lot. I don't know about you guys, but I really feel like EELS is the embodiment of everything that we're learning in class. And it's a really great way to put into practice everything that we've been talking about from financial management to creating a network and connections and facilitating conversations in the arts. It's It's like really hitting the ground running kind of thing. Absolutely. When I first started at AU, um, I took on the role as finance director my first semester in the program. And we also in the first semester do fundraising and financial management. I felt like everyone else was learning all these financial terms, financial management strategies, but I actually got to be hands on because I was doing it all for EELS. Yeah, I want to highlight Faith there because she really jumped in. We were in need of a finance person. Uh, There were two of us who were continuing from last year and Faith like just jumped in and, and took on that role. So she really jumped right in there for that. Liz, that one has been like for you jumping into a marketing role that seems maybe a little bit outside your comfort zone. Part of the reason why I love this opportunity is A, because I get to kind of put my foot back in the door of the arts world, which I've been missing for a while. 
because I am studying public administration and public affairs. So I really love the creative aspect of it. But I also love how educational it's been because I had done a couple internships prior to this in communications and development. Getting to kind of uh, grow in communications has been really fun. And Ali's been really great at teaching me different strategies for outreach. And, you know, getting to use different software has been really great. That is awesome. What a wonderful hands-on experience. I'm a huge proponent of hands-on learning and getting to use the tools that you're being given like immediately so you actually understand how they function in the real world. So I love this program. So excited that they have such wonderful leaders like the three of you. So clearly you all have a passion for the art. So let's talk a little about your origin stories. So what brought you, the three of you, to the arts? And was there like a pivotal moment or event that made you say to yourself, I need to do this? Or was it slower, more gradual series of experiences that led you into the arts and then into the graduate programs that you're in today? For me, I started with music being in my life from a really young age, like around seven, my dad put me on a piano. So it's just been a thing that's always been in my life. I've always been aware of it. My brother was always in band growing up. So I always watched him. Once I was old enough to actually have an instrument, I said to myself, I'm going to be better than my brother. That drove me through high school, really. And then once I was in high school, I took on like different leadership roles in band, like started realizing music is something I cannot live without in my entire life. So I have to go through and go get a degree in it. Lizette, what about you? So I also started uh, my arts journey in music. So I've been playing piano since I was three or four. And then as soon as I could start band at age nine, I started playing clarinet. And then I also picked up saxophone when I was in middle school. So I absolutely loved music from a young age. I actually started college studying music education and realized I love music. I don't love teaching. And so I decided to switch majors. There aren't many safe majors in music besides the music education route. And so that's why I decided to switch to technical theater. I'm not an actor myself, but I love theater. I love seeing productions. I love seeing how they're made. And so that's kind of how I found myself in that world. And then from there, um, I did a lot of sound design when I was in college studying theater. So after I decided to get my certificate of audio engineering, and then that's kind of how I found myself in my current job, which is uh, doing project management for an audiovisual integration company. So I've had kind of like a very roundabout journey to get to where I am today. So yeah, I've been doing project management for this one company for four or five years now. And I'm just not all that passionate about the AV industry because, you know, it's kind of lacking that creativity that I love about the arts. So I decided to go back to school and make a career change. I figured first step was to go back to school and get my master's degree. And I looked at the program that Morgan and Faith are in, the arts management program. I just kind of thought it might be safer to go the MPA route, the Master of Public Administration, because you can do a lot more things with that in case I can't get a job in an arts organization. That way I could do like any nonprofit work. So, um, yeah, so I'm getting my MPA right now. I've got a concentration in nonprofit management and a focus in arts management. So that's kind of my journey so far. Wonderful. Thanks for sharing. Morgan, what about you? I got involved in community theater from a really young age. My parents took me to see a community theater show. And afterwards, I asked them, can I do that? And they said, what are you talking about? And um, (laughs) then I was like, can I get up there and do that? And they were like, I don't know, maybe. So I kind of I got started in acting. And that was my passion for a really long time and still is. But uh, I majored in mass communication and theater in undergrad and then moved to Chicago to become an actor. Um, I thought that's what I was going to do professionally long term. Then the pandemic happened. I had a little too much time to think and I realized that I have a lot of passion for arts management. So that's how I found myself here in this program. I love that. I also got my start in community theater, Morgan. So I feel you. I feel you right there. So Lizette, how do you envision you transferring your PA degree or your nonprofit experience into the arts field? Or how do you think that that degree is going to help you moving forward? Well, that was definitely part of my thought process when I decided which degree program I wanted to pursue. I knew going into it that a lot of theater companies are nonprofits, unless you're talking Broadway, of course. So I knew that getting a degree in you know, an MPA with a nonprofit management concentration would be useful because most arts organizations in this country are nonprofits. So I'm 
hoping to uh, get a career in like development or communications for an arts organization. I think that'd be really fun. I did two development uh, internships for a nonprofit here in DC. And so I think getting to translate those skills that I learned in those internships from a general nonprofit to specifically an arts organization would be really beneficial and really fulfilling for me because it'd be combining like my two interests and affinity for management skills, you know, multi multitasking different projects. I've also learned about grant writing, which I really like. I come from like a writing background. I think I can transfer those skills over to the nonprofit world because funding is really important. And a lot of that comes from grants. That's kind of what I'm hoping to do. Excellent. So can you tell us a little bit about your the structure of the program and what you think has been the most valuable part of your graduate programs thus far? We do have like a core of like financial management, marketing, cultural policy, additional sort of elective courses. But I do feel like it's been really well-rounded. What's been the most valuable part? The guest speakers that we have in class are always really a standout to me. Um, Our professors do a lot to make sure that they're bringing in um, really interesting people, um, a lot of them alums of the program to talk to us. um, And that's been really uh, great. Great. Faith, what's your experience been like? Mine is very similar to Morgan's. They did restructure the program when we came in so that we have all of our like core classes like fundraising, marketing, financial management, cultural policy, all those things in the first year of the program. And then we take our like comps exam and then we have the electives and we work on our capstone project during the second year. When I was choosing arts administration programs, some schools require you to have a internship. Some schools require you to have a project. And I wasn't sure which one I wanted. And I originally thought that the internship route was the way to go. American University recently changed it so that you can do a capstone project and have it be either an internship, any kind of project that you want in the concentration that you are looking for. And you can really alter the capstone to be anything you want that you think is going to be the most valuable experience for you. And I think that's just the best part of the structure of our program. AU also doesn't uh, have an internship requirement like a lot of other grad programs do. Their kind of concept on that is like not making you pay to do an internship where you don't get paid. Fascinating. I'm going to relate that to the wider industry conversation around internships and unpaid internships. So let's take a little detour. How do you feel about (laughs) as young professionals coming into the field, having to decide and, and consider like, doing an internship versus not. How do you all feel about that current conversation? Is that something that you talk about on a regular basis? Was that part of your decision-making process in choosing a program? Faith and I were having a conversation about this the other day, actually. I feel really strongly about the concept of internships. I feel really privileged to have been able to do three internships in the past year. I think that they've made a lot of difference in my understanding of where I want to go as far as career goes. I think all internships should be paid because you're doing a job. And I've been lucky to have paid internships. But yeah, no, I I think that that's an important change that needs to happen in our industry is that um, people need to be paid fairly for the labor that they do. I do really see the value of doing an internship. I got a lot of experience really fast. Well, it's funny that you said that, Morgan, that uh, the school doesn't require you to do an internship because my school of public affairs requires us to do internships and most of them Uh, are unpaid. Oh, interesting. (laughs) So I just had to do two unpaid internships. I agree with you. I definitely think that, you know, if you're going to require students to do an internship, it should be paid because they are doing work. They're helping your company or organization. Um, I did two theater internships when I was doing my undergrad. They are really great experiences because that's how you gain, you know, the firsthand knowledge, the experience, uh, the skills, the networking. But Mm -hmm. I definitely think that they should be compensated more. So and then, Morgan, you mentioned the word privilege. Um, You felt Mm -hmm. privileged to be able to do these things. So let's talk about that for a second. Unpaid internships are a privilege. What are your feelings on that as people who are going through this experience, seeing your cohort, seeing your colleagues having to make these decisions about Are they doing an internship? Are they doing a capstone? Are they choosing a program based on that requirement? And then as graduate students, 
you're not making very much money, right? And <laughs> you're like trying to work and do classes. Where does that privilege come in? And what are your thoughts about the future? I think it's starting to happen that more internships and apprenticeships are starting to be paid, but I think it could be happening more. I mean, especially based off of all our experiences of what we just said. But I think that that's really important because, I mean, having done the internships that I've done, I feel like I got a lot of benefit out of them and out of those experiences. And I do see a lot of people who are emerging in arts management in grad school who want to do internships. And it's hard to have the space and time and other resources to be able to be able to do that. Yeah, I feel like it is a privilege to be able to do them. And it's not a privilege that is available to everybody. But yeah. Excellent. yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts about internships and apprenticeships. I know that is something we've been talking about a lot in the field in the last, I would say, probably five years that really has emerged as a, as a conversation. You've seen a lot of theaters in New York change their policies and practices, and people are interrogating what it means to have unpaid labor in especially nonprofit spaces. So I think that's going to be a really interesting continuing conversation. So let's keep going down that topic and let's talk about equity a little bit. So I know one of the topics that you'll be exploring during the symposium this coming spring is around equity in the field. So I'd love to hear a little bit more of what that session is gonna, going to look like and just your thoughts as future emerging leaders around equitable practices and what you're most interested in in terms of this conversation around diversity and equity in the performing arts field. Our morning session is going to be on EDIA and engagement and that conversation is still shaping up, but we want that to be an opening to our day. So our theme for this year's symposium is Arts Engage. Uh, so we're examining how we engage, what engagement looks like, how engagement can be more equitable in the arts. Uh, so we want that to be an opening to that conversation about what equity and engagement look like together. For me, I've been like really thinking about this a lot as this has shaped up to become our theme. I think for me, it's about active listening. It's about being leaders and using the power that we have as leaders to listen to the the voices that are around us and to use what those voices are saying to implement real change. Lizette, what about you? Obviously, as a woman and a minority, I definitely think that equity and diversity are very important. I think it's becoming more important in the arts than it used to be, which is obviously good. That's the direction we want to move in, but I would definitely love to see more representation. I mean, I know like as an Asian American, I don't see that much representation personally in like theater or movies or whatever you want to uh, say in the arts, but I would just love to see leaders in the field right now working to provide like an outlet for these artists and these technicians and designers and just kind of opening the doors to them because I think that's the main thing because they're obviously there these people exist these people want to uh, tell their stories but they just don't really have the platform for it and I think that's mm -hmm. the main problem. Are these conversations that you're actively having as a part of your studies with your professors with guest speakers with colleagues kind of around this shift in the broader industry? Last semester in our finance class we had an assignment that we we each did every week and we brought articles to the class and kind of had a discussion and almost the entire time the topic of DEIA got brought up every time. And really we all like what the consensus ended up being most of the time was that many organizations tend to talk about how to do equitable practices and how to have more diversity and inclusion, but they don't actually know how to implement it without tokenizing people. Um, and most, we generally feel like we would like to have a example of what organizations are doing it right instead of the ones that are just talking about it and saying that they have a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, but don't actually practice it. So as... I mean, frankly, the next generation, you're all in your mid 20s, you're looking at launching careers in this, what does leadership in that space look like for you right now? So Faith, you mentioned that see, it's you, you and your cohort feel like there's not actually a lot of positive leadership in that space, a lot of positive change. So for the three of you, at least, what would that look like for you? Or what do you have sitting in the back of your minds in terms of what you are interested in doing in this space moving forward? I think there was someone at APAP, Katie, who in one of the sessions said, um, and I can't quite remember who it was, but they said that um, you shouldn't start to engage in community engagement or EDIA practices until you know the why for your organization. 
Yeah. Major snaps, Morgan. Major snaps there. So what is the why for you? Doing community engagement work, leading this kind of work for my own institution. I know my personal why. I know why I want my institution to do more of this and to focus on serving the community that we have now and the community of the future. But for you, what's the what's the why? So I think the why for me is the why that I love the arts, which is community. And we can't call ourselves a community unless we're engaging in equitable practice and we're trying to make everyone's voices heard and everyone has an equal sort of opportunity to be involved. Um, That's not community for me. So I think it's only community when that happens. There's one person who I actually really look up to in this space, if we're talking about leadership in the arts, and he was actually my old boss at my theater internships uh, back in 2015, which seems like a really long time ago now. But since then, so my internship is at the public theater. He was one of the production managers there. And since um, my internship ended, he has created two new businesses, which are both focused on helping to elevate, you know, these voices that are often unheard. He created this consulting agency. It's an arts uh, consulting agency. And they focus on specifically, you know, striving to look for, you know, artists and administrators of color, people from typically marginalized groups and kind of like put them in the front door, like I was saying before, for these different job opportunities to let their voices be heard. He also created like this place called Codify Art, which is like a multidisciplinary collective of QT POC artists. He has literally given them a platform to showcase their art and it's like any kind of art it's not specifically visual arts but they really focus on showcasing works created by artists of color you know women queer trans artists uh, people like that and I just think that's really beautiful and really amazing and we need more of that it's actually taking action right you're you're saying yeah doing the work (laughs) like creating space exactly so like we're starting to see it yeah just I would love more of it Um, So let's talk a little bit about gender. In that same vein, um, like you said, you clearly, you know, you're a little bit younger than me. You're clearly on the precipice of stepping into actually being active in the industry. So as younger women, you're going to be taking on larger roles. What concerns do you have at this moment? So you're in school, you're working, you are learning all of these things, you're interacting with professionals. So what concerns do you have as young women entering the performing arts field? I think one of the largest concerns for me is when I was doing education, majority of the band directors in my county at the time were older men. And as a young woman going into the field, I got looked down a lot. It's interesting because a lot of the time, though, now in arts programs, you see a lot more female or non-binary people in these programs instead of strictly men like it has been in the past. So I'm hopeful that in the future, we won't have so many problems, all genders be accepted in every field. But that's something that's always in the back of my mind is getting scrutinized for being a young woman starting my career. I I also have that same concern. Um, But I think I also like I look to the arts management field and there are a lot of other women in the arts management field, but there aren't a lot of women in the top positions. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that's something that concerns me. I do think that's something that's starting to change, but I think we could see it change more quickly because I know a lot of women leaders that should be at the top. Amen. Amen. (laughs) I'm actually taking a human resources class right now. And we were just talking about like gender inequities. We were talking about what Morgan was saying, how like the higher up you go in the like career arc, you don't see as many women, but you see a lot of men in leadership positions. Definitely a problem. I mean, we weren't looking specifically at the arts, but I know it's kind of like it spans all (laughs) industries. And the fact that the gender pay disparities are still an issue. We need more women to be in leadership positions. They should be paid fairly and people should listen to what they have to say because it's usually good stuff. And a lot of times a woman might say something, it gets overlooked, but then a man says something and then they're like, oh, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And just, we have to be aware of that. My teacher in my nonprofit class talked a little bit about benefits and pay in the world of nonprofits. And a lot of people are under the assumption that uh, people who work for a nonprofit aren't paid that well or aren't compensated. And she was saying that that isn't necessarily the truth, or at least it shouldn't be because nonprofits still want to attract like the top uh, talent that they can. And so how do you attract that talent uh, by paying them and compensating them and providing benefits? And so it should definitely be on the table. Nonprofits shouldn't, uh, you know, not do that just because, you know, they're seen as like this charitable organization. They should still pay their employees well. 
if they want to get good employees in return. Yeah, absolutely. It's still like a place of business and yeah. it's still, um, it's a, it's a work environment. Yeah, exactly. Work has to be done and it has to be done well. So exactly. And overhead costs are important. <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep talking a little bit about this and intergenerational leadership. So a lot of the things we just talked about, like have to do a lot with how previous generations have set up our workplaces, have structured benefits, have structured pay, pay structures. Um, so what do you as emerging leaders want those already in the industry to know about you and your counterparts as you start working together? And what are your expectations for intergenerational leadership moving forward? So someone at our table at APAP, Katie, asked me as a younger person what I what support I personally would like to see from those of an older generation who might be more established in the field. I was really surprised by that question, and it's like kind of been running in the back of my head ever since. But I think it really comes down to respect as a colleague. I may not have the years of experience, but I can tell when someone respects me as a colleague. And uh, the times that I've experienced this, I really felt like that person was a mentor to me. It goes both ways, right? You know, that I mentor them in ways as well. And so I think that's the beauty of intergenerational leadership. I think for me, um, we just talked about this kind of in my HR class at AU um, about like the different generations and how their work ethics are different or their work styles are different. And it kind of goes back to the work-life balance. Um, my teacher was saying that his generation or like the older generation, they were used to just working way more than they should have and more than what was healthy for them just because that's what was expected of them. Mm -hmm. And he applauded, you know, the younger generations, millennials and Gen Z for knowing their worth and knowing their limits and kind of, you know, taking a step back and saying, this is what I can do. And I need to be able to rest and take care of myself to do a good job. And so kind of having conversations about that and having like, if there's you know, an older, more traditional person in a leadership role, maybe knowing how to best treat your employees so that they work the best for you. Just having that work-life balance, I think it's really important. Do you feel like your communication styles as young professionals are different than those, uh, you know, either your professors, other professionals you're working with in the field? Um, I've, I hear this a lot, that communication styles are really different. So how would you define your communication styles and what advice would you give to millennials, um, Gen X, baby boomers that are in the workplace about communicating with emerging talent coming into the workplace for the first time? So thinking about the way that we communicate in EELS, something that I try to keep in mind anytime I'm communicating is to be as transparent as possible. Um, and I think that that's something that I've seen from the Gen Z and emerging generations that's really important is this sense of transparency. So that's why I think I would tell um, older generations is that Gen Z uh, and the younger generations value transparency. Um, and it's something that we need to see in the workplace. I would say I value like immediate communication or like not necessarily like instant gratification, but just getting back to me in a timely manner, you know actually like reading your employees messages and responding to them in a timely manner, which I think is kind of just being polite. Uh, but I think that should be important for people as well. Yeah, I so agree with you, Lizette. Response is so important, even if that response is no, or you don't have time right now or get back to it later. Yeah, that's a big thing is people often will read it, but not let you know that they read it. And you have no idea if they know that you communicated with them at all, or if you got their message or what. So to actually tell you if they got your message or not is super important. Yeah. So you don't feel like you're talking to a wall. Yeah. <laughs> I love this. I love this very practical, very, I mean, spot on advice. I mean, this is just great office etiquette, period. <laughs> and I, lo I love that it's, it's coming out of this conversation. So I love those uh, those pieces of advice. Anything else you want to add before we move on? Just also, it's really important nowadays with all the remote work and the telework because we aren't all in the office together anymore uh, for most places anyway. And so you can't just go over to the next cubicle or the next room and just, hey, did you get my message? You actually just have to send it on Teams or text or email and just mm -hmm. wait for a response. And so the waiting time is killer. Yeah. yeah. But I would say too, I something that people often tell me about is that they connect their work emails to their phones because we have the option to do that. Yeah. And some people, you know, some people will communicate or communicate, geez, will commute to work. <laughs> um, and 
do work emails on their commute or, you know, whatever, but you have to have that boundary. Like we were talking about before with work-life balance that goes into that as well. Like you might be doing remote work. You might have all of those things, but your colleagues need to remember that you are a person and you have boundaries. And if you don't respond after a certain period of time in the night, like they can't be upset about that. Yeah. And going along with that, like if you are a boss and you respond after work hours, then your employees will think that you expect that of them as well. Yeah. I just want to say real quick, that's literally my situation at work, or at least when I first started, because my boss doesn't come into the office until like two or 3 PM. And then he leaves at one or 2 AM. And so I would get so many messages at like 11 PM or midnight. And when I first started, I was like, Oh, am I supposed to respond? Oh, he wants me to start this project now. And so kind of learning. Exactly. Communicating expectations, right. And setting (laughs) policies, setting those boundaries. It sounds like that's really important to you and your your colleagues your cohorts yeah Definitely. i would agree mm-hmm. ladies let's think back to maybe the moment you decided on your major in undergrad what do you know now that you wish you had known then i wish that i would have known that well let me go back my dad said that i could not stick to per Um, a performance degree solely on clarinet and that I had to do an education degree because I needed a job that would be able to support me no matter what. Um, And I did love teaching those kids. I loved every single minute of it, but I so much more loved the Per, like the administration side of it and managing the concerts and getting all the music and making the programs and all of those things more than the actual process of teaching. So I wish that I knew that I shouldn't go into this just because I need a job when I get out. I was very confused when I did my undergraduate degree. So like I said, I started out in music. I did music performance and music education on clarinet. <laughs> so learn a bass. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you it's really hard to get a job in music performance for clarinet. (laughs) Like I said, I didn't, I, well, I discovered I didn't want to be a teacher after I started taking the classes and I was like, Oh, this is a lot of work for something I really don't like. (laughs) And so after that, I decided to switch majors. I couldn't be undeclared because I came in with too many credits. So I just picked communications for a short brief time before finding technical theater. And so if I could go back, I would probably just major in something like arts administration. Now that I know that I like management, I like doing project management and back pole side of things. Um, I wish I could have done that for the arts to start with, but I mean, everything happens for a reason. I found my way here indirectly, so it's all good. I mean, I was going to say too, you know, those are things that you wish you know now that we are where we are, but really would we have been able to get to where we are now and be in this program and be all together if we weren't going through those things and if we didn't take that path? Maybe, Mm -hmm. maybe not. Like Faith, you have such a um, expertise now in arts education. And so like when we're talking about that in conversations and stuff, I feel like I I look to you because that's something that I don't know about. So yeah, well, that definitely like it took me from wanting to just do like arts management in general to now looking more towards cultural policy and how to change the policies that go into arts education. And if I didn't have that background, that would never have happened. Mm-hmm. So you can't really regret anything that you do in life. Morgan, what about you? What do you wish you had known back then that you know now? I wish I had known the value of arts and I think for so long I was like I I have to keep trying to be an actor because I love acting but I was making myself miserable trying to go out for these roles that I didn't really like just to book a gig kind of thing and now I'm feeling so much more of a passion for it again it being more of a a passion for me and and something that I do and in addition to and you know I'm still working in the arts kind of over the past few years I've realized a lot about the value of balance in in my life how important it is to have multiple things and be multiple things and have work life hobbies balance. Balance is key. I love that. Arts and. I have never heard that phrase before and I really love that. So thank you for sharing that. Well, ladies, it has been such a pleasure to have the three of you with us today on There's No Business Like. I have so enjoyed our conversation and I am so excited for the future and I can't wait to see what the three of you do and I hope you'll stay in touch. Thanks for taking the time out of your very busy work and school schedules and art making schedules to join us here today. 
Thank you so much for having us. Hey, Katie, thanks so much for introducing us to Morgan, Lizette and Faith. Um, Another great thing that came from that meeting that you had with Morgan at APAP is that um, as part of their Emerging Arts Leaders Summit, um, they invited the team here to lead the networking event. And, um, you know, I guess because I'm the one who lives closest to American University in Washington, D.C., um, I have the opportunity to lead that. So I'm just so excited to get to do that and to see um, this meeting that you had with her sort of come, I don't know if it's 360, I don't know where we're at on the circle at this point, but just so many awesome things have come from that one meeting. And I just wanted to lift up that you should always go up and say hello to somebody at a session. Um, even if you're not sure that it's ever going to go anywhere or you think, oh, they don't want to hear from me or whatever. Um, we do. People do. People do want to make those connections and it can lead to some cool stuff. Well, I do think it is full circle because, I mean, it, that is the prime example of why networking is important. I mean, because Morgan did that, like you brought it back to, you know, leading the networking session. Katie, I really appreciated you bringing up the pay equity conversation and just, uh, you know, about um, those kind of things. What I really sort of always try to drive home with folks is that you know, we need to start running our nonprofits like for profits and that the the really good nonprofits are doing that. And that pay equity is very important because like they were saying, I mean, it takes good people to run organizations. And I sort of push back on this conversation about overhead um, because we have been trained for so long to think of like staff time and salaries as this overhead cost. But the reality is, is that a majority of that is truly program costs. Because without people running these programs, these programs do not happen. So when I think about, you know, Quad City Arts and I think about our salaries, I think about, you know, about 15% of our salaries as sort of overhead because there's some general admin work that has to be done. But the rest of that, like that's going, that's boots on the ground. That's, you know, people doing the job without that. Like we don't have visiting artists in the schools. We don't have, you know, artists showcasing in our galleries. Kevin, talk about what you did like with the pay equity when you started? Are you saying like what I did with pay equity at here? Quetzal yeah. Arts? Like, didn't you like, y- you made everybody's salary the same? Like, that's really important. You need to talk about that. Yeah. So here at, at Quad City Arts, when we started talking about pay equity and it's a conversation that took a couple of years, I'll be honest, because it's a hard transition to make. I mean, what we did was we looked at all of our positions and we tried to take as much information as we could from, you know, some national studies on, um, positions in the arts. Um, typically, the one we primarily relied on was one from Americans for the Arts that they did, I think, in 2018, 2019. Um, and so we took that data and then we added cost of living for each year up into where we were and right sized all of our salaries. Um, and it was a jump. I mean, for it was a big increase in our salaries for some folks, a couple of the were, were there. Um, But since then, what we've also done is sort of made a commitment to shifting with the cost of living as well. Like, you know, adding that as, um, as their, their salaries and that they're, you know, at the end of the year, their raises, it's challenging. I mean, when you've got a year when, you know, 8% uh, inflation costs or 8% cost of living um, this past year, I mean, I'll I'll say that our team did 6% across the board. um, And that's because in the Midwest, those indicators show that we were at 5.8% cost of living. So we had transitioned to 6%. And that is something that many for-profit companies aren't doing um, because it's challenging. Like it's it's not going to be an easy budgetary year for it, but I think it's the right thing to do because cost of living, if if your salary doesn't increase by that, like you've essentially taken a pay cut. That's really awesome, Kevin. Kevin, thank you for sharing such a practical, like real life uh, example, because one of the things uh, Faith and Lizette and Morgan mentioned is that they are seeking out ex- real world ex- examples of organizations that are doing diversity, equity, and inclusion work well, and they are not seeing it or that it's not being publicized or it, it's not in spaces that they have access to. So I thought that was such an an insightful point of the discussion that we had about like they are craving training in this they're craving for information they're craving examples but as we as we as professionals are we doing the right storytelling are we presenting those real world examples to the next generation so they can they can then evaluate and say 
this is a great model. This isn't a great model. Um, who's doing it well? Who's not? Who am I following the lead of? Um, how can I build on that? So I appreciate, you know, actually like having some practical examples of an organization that is taking that seriously and doing it well. And so for me, it's like, well, where where is the storytelling happening? How are they gaining access to that? And how are we supporting them in being the next generation of leaders, particularly in that space? Well, Katie, to your point, it is happening in you know throughout the industry, especially more today. Um, and a lot of those people leading those efforts are so busy doing the work that they don't have time to go out and toot their own horns. But the stories are out there, and that's part of why why we're bringing this podcast to be able to lift those stories up, along with many others, to the to the field and. Um, and I'm glad that we're here doing that, as well as even in a lot of the consortiums and the service organizations, they're doing a lot of the programs where they'll bring somebody in as the um, to, to give the example of the work that they're doing. So it it's hard when you're just starting out in the industry to know where to, to hear these stories. So, you know, obviously... Welcome to our podcast. Hopefully you're finding them here, <laughs> but also, um, but also, you know, as we've said many times, look into state consortiums, look into, you know, organizations that are within the industry because they do have these programs where they'll invite speakers, they'll invite panelists, they'll invite people to uh, show the examples, talk about the examples of, of this work that's happening. So that way others can learn from it too, that aren't quite there yet. And, and do it too. Yeah. And in reflecting on this interview, um, after I was listening to it as sort of the place where we are right now, as we're sort of calling ourselves midfielders, um, in sort of like the time when, you know, when I was in college and when I was sort of coming up through now, a lot of the origin stories that I heard was, um, you know, I fell into it and these people that, um, you know, were leaders in the field at that time. And many of them still are now where it was like, you know, I was a performer, I was on this other path and this job at a university or this job at like a local arts organization just popped up and, and I was there, I was in a good place at the right time. And, you know, now I'm a, now, now this job has a title and, um, is like one of those like kind of awesome, uh, coming of age stories almost in a way, but listening to the intentionality that the three of them have in why they're coming into the arts and that, it's not something that they're falling into. They're being super intentional about wanting to get the training to be able to go and be um, really productive parts of organizations. And one day arts leaders feels, I mean, it's, that's a transition that's, you know, been made in the last like 10 to 15 years. And, you know, in some ways, some of these programs are so new, but also in other ways, I mean, there are people that have been entering the field now for a while that really do have the right education um, an education that didn't exist, you know, 30 years ago. Um, and, you know, to me, I, I like I it gives me two thoughts of like, well, I hope that this never gets too restrictive where people that don't have the access to grad school, right, can't get into the field. But at the same time, like the field is like we're in good hands, like things are people are really trying to lead in a very positive equity first um place. And like 10 years from now, I'm like, so excited to see where we are as a field. Yeah, I, I think you guys covered so many wonderful topics and, and did it well. But I think instead of just rehashing everything that, that you guys talked about, which we could do all day, and I would, you know, I, I was really excited. I think the the grand picture of things that the way I walked away from this interview, was that I feel really encouraged, like Daniel just said about the next generation. I, I think it's, we're in great hands and, um, and they're approaching it differently than, than we did because of that intentionality that Danielle's talking about that wasn't there necessarily uh, as a straight path for, for most of us. As we talk to more people and interview more of the seasoned folks and including our stories, um, you know, we all came to a thinking, oh, you know, when we're asked our origin story, we're like, oh, I kind of have an unusual story. But actually what we're finding out is the unusual story is the usual story, that the direct path is the unusual story. And so this next generation, there's going to be more of those direct paths. And that's going to be interesting to see how that itself, how may affect the field. I'm excited about what they're going to do, but I just think um, it's going to be, it, there's going to be some kind of difference and, and I can't wait to see what it is. It made me, the interview really made me think about the communication style aspect. Um, just listening to that made me think about how I'm approaching communication style. I'm implementing communication protocols 
rather than talking to people about it. Like it, it's not being proactive to what other people's strengths may be from a communication standpoint. It's, hey, here's how to conform to mine is what I'm putting out there. And that's probably not the best approach. Um, and so like, for example, one person on my team regularly messages me about business through Facebook Messenger. And it drives me nuts. But at the same time, I'm like, they are communicating with me. And if that's the communication that is most comfortable for them and easiest for them and, and ac accessible for them, maybe I should reconsider my stance on it. Setting expectations, right? And being clear to Josh's point about uh, communication style. So if you know you're going to be overloaded communicating to your staff or whomever you're in conversation with, like, Hey, I, it might be a while before, yeah, before I get back to you. Or my general policy is I will return your email within 72 hours. Like whatever that might be, um, having that in your email signature or making that clear to your staff uh, that this is this is the way I need to operate because of X, Y, and Z. I think what they're really looking for is just transparency. That's what Morgan started that part, part of the conversation with was transparency. Um, and those little things, setting those boundaries or setting those expectations expectations goes a really long way in building trust between yourself, your staff and colleagues, external colleagues. One of the best things that I did with my team when I started here at Quad City Arts was lay out some of those expectations because they were talking about work-life balance. And I tell all my new hires and uh, whenever I start working with somebody new that um, I don't expect them to check their email after five. Um, and that I don't check my email after five either. So one, if you need to get a hold of me, like you got to call me. Um, but two, if I send you an email after five, like my poor time management uh, is not your priority. Um, and if in the rare occurrence that something has to get done after hours, I will call you um, because I want to create that work-life balance as well. And we all know like having your email go straight to your phone can easily like disrupt your night and then just kind of like ruin everything. So the more I can facilitate like them shutting that down, the the more I will. Well, I I love I love the EALS program itself, and that it it is run by the students for the students' own advancement and betterment, and that by by them running the program and running the the conference that they are having, the event that they're having, the leadership summit, that that they are actively working in their own interest for their own education, which is an incredibly cool thing that it is. It allows them to program to their own needs and interest rather than other people in the field. And it's not just people at American or that are living in DC that are coming. It's there are people from other states. There are like groups of other um, uh, college programs that are coming to attend this. So it's not, it, it, it's a, it's a yeah. big conference and symposium. It's all happening in one day. And it, but, but it's my huge. favorite part about it is that it's, it's, it's students themselves that are, that are facilitating what's going to happen at, at that event so that their own interests are being addressed. So this episode is going to be dropping just a few days before the 2023 Emerging Arts Leaders Symposium in Washington, D.C. And like we mentioned earlier, Danielle will be there. So if you've listened to this podcast or any other episodes of the show, please make sure you say hello. Let her know how much you're enjoying the show, hopefully. Um, and thanks again for joining us today on There's No Business Like. We'll see you next time. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening to There's No Business Like. Our producers and hosts are Brian Zelmer, Josh Benson, Kevin Maynard, Katie Miller, and me, Danielle Van Hoek. Views expressed in this podcast are ours alone and are not reflective of the organizations we are a part of. Keep up with us at nobusinesslife.com. There you'll find links to all of our episodes and socials. If you like this podcast, give us a like, a follow, a review, or our favorite, a five-star rating. Oh, wait, what was that site? <laughs> I got it. Don't worry. It is no business like dot com. Do I sound out bus I miss every time I type it? Yep, sure do. Stay in touch, my friends. Um, we have a problem. Nobody ever brought us back in the time machine.
Oh no. <laughs> oh no. Okay, let me do that again. Let me do that. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Thank Screwing you. Screwing up the time space continuum here. <laughs> I, I want to take us on a different trajectory. Have you learned nothing from <laughs> whole new universe? Okay. We're on a new branch. I think somebody did screw up the space time continuum because the five of us have a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> <That was it. laughs>